You are listening to the Rising Pineapples Inspirational Talks, a video podcast series of interviews to empower women to reach their full potential. You share your questions with us and we'll bring amazing women who will answer by sharing their stories with you. Today I'll be speaking with Amel Hamouda, an executive vice president who recently left Air France after nearly 20 years. She'll be telling us about her main drivers over the past years and how her curiosity and hunger to learn contributed to her continuous growth. Amel has had an impressive career and more importantly has stayed true to herself throughout. I hope you'll enjoy this conversation and will find it as inspiring as I did. Um, so today we have Amel speaking with us. First of all, I would like you to introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your history, where you're from, what you studied and how you started working at Air France. Uh, where I'm from, actually, I was born in France in uh, 1977. So in a few days, I will be 44, which uh, makes me very old. And, uh, 22 years ago, actually, I started working for Air France. So that's uh, yeah, half of my uh, life that I spent uh, in Air France, actually. I was born in Paris from Algerian parents. And as we're just traveling, I love the fact that we are all part of the same world, and I love uh, multiculturalism, if I uh, can say so, universalism and uh, all the, the mixing of, uh, of people and culture. And I think that's why uh, I've always been uh, very interested in diversity in all uh, the dimensions. So I was always asked to go for engineering or mathematics studies because that's where I was uh, good at. I was also good at French. I was also good at foreign languages, but in France, we have a very elitist system. Let's say the elitist way is to go for mathematics and engineering studies. So I just followed the, the advice of uh, my teachers at that time, not because I was uh, fond of it, but just because I was told to do so. So mm-hmm. I ended up in an uh, engineering school and I became uh, an engineer, even if, uh, if I'm honest with you, I love mathematics. I never loved uh, physics or chemistry or all uh, the rest of uh, what uh, you need to, to be an engineer. But anyhow, at the end of uh, my engineering uh, studies, um, I spent one year in England mm-hmm. because I wanted to discover another country. And that's where I met people working for Air France. And at that time, I was studying uh, in transport uh, engineering and planning. And so I just applied for a job in Air France, not knowing anything about it, just that uh, there were some uh, nice people working there and uh, it would be great to meet them. And so uh, that's how I ended up uh, starting my career end of 99 in Air France, in a brand new department at that time that was called revenue management, yield management. It was really the beginning of uh, these jobs and uh, it was a bit of every flight by studying uh, yeah, the history, the customer behaviors in order to anticipate uh, how far you could go in terms of pricing and uh, filling the flights. Wow. Eventually, you ended up staying for a large part of your career in Air France. So could you tell me a little bit about what you were doing when you first joined Air France um, and kind of a little bit about your transition throughout the company in different departments that you worked in? Actually, I I never made any plan. And uh, I remember a lot of uh, my uh, fellow colleagues or a lot of managers telling me, what do you want to do in 10 years time, et cetera. I I was never able to have an idea so far. I just took every step and every job the way they they came and uh, always um, looked for short-term pleasure, enjoying uh, the current position and not thinking uh, 10 years ahead. So indeed, when I joined Air France, I thought I would stay there two, three years, maybe five, whatever. And in the end, I stayed, I stayed more than 20 years. As I told you, I started in revenue management. What I really loved there is that it was a mix of uh, young people that uh, just finished their studies and were hired there to bring new ideas, but also a lot of more experienced people coming from all over the place uh, in Air France and sharing their experience. So it was a perfect mix to start and to learn. If I have to talk a little bit about myself, I think one of my drivers is always to learn new stuff. So I started this way, and that's really, I think, uh, what I did throughout these 20 years. At the beginning, I was really motivated by content, so and uh, specifically the strategic content, having a, a vision, building a vision, and trying to achieve uh, big changes uh, in, uh, in the company strategy. Maybe that's what really drove my, yeah, maybe my first 10 years in Air France. And then all of a sudden, and I did not think about it, but I realized it later on, 
I became very interested in people. On, on top of the content, what really motivated me was to create teams that would have a lot of energy, enthusiasm. The best compliments I can uh, receive is really when my teams told me, uh, yeah, you asked us uh, for impossible stuff, but you helped us uh, do it. And I think that's really me. No limit. And nothing is impossible uh, in terms of uh, strategy, vision, projects. But when you, once you have the, the team to do it, you can do anything. And my biggest pleasure, the, I would say the second part of my career was really to have a team being able to do much more than me, much better than me. And I was just here to push them a little bit, to help them when needed. But I was just amazed and I was as a child amazed by uh, their accomplishments. So going back to the first part of your career, um, how much of your progression in Air France was you pushing for more responsibility, bigger roles, and how much of it was your manager, or I guess you had various managers throughout the time that were really encouraging you and supporting you in that? Yeah, there's not one answer to your question. Actually, it was really a, a mix of both. I remember one of my first managers that uh, maybe changed my career. I, ha I had a position uh, that I liked, but I really wanted to uh, do something else. I was starting to get bored. And I think, uh, yeah, boredom is one of my uh, drivers. When I get bored, I need to do something else. Uh, and I get bored quite uh, quickly, to be honest. So um, he, he, we had an, uh, a meeting and um, he was trying to help me for the next step. And... Uh, he asked me one question that was really helpful. He said, what's your dream job? I don't want to hear about something that you have thought of, something that seems reasonable. That's not what I'm interested in. What is your dream job? And I think that guy really helped me because uh, I could tell him what was my dream job. And uh, since that day, uh, I never put myself uh, barriers or yeah, you know, internal limits. People all around, all around you always try to refrain you or put limits. So my first advice would be never put limits to yourself. And really that manager was uh, very important because uh, he had me removing these uh, barriers. And I think all along my career since then, I've tried to do the same with uh, the men or women that uh, I've tried uh, to coach because uh, there are so many limits coming from outside that for sure you should never try and limit yourself. I, I met great managers that helped me. And I also had a, maybe a bit of a strange or peculiar uh, behavior, uh, temper that, uh, as I told you, once I get bored, I cannot uh, pretend uh, to enjoy. And so I need, uh, I made it very clear that I needed some changes. So when he asked you what your dream job was, did you say something that was related to reaching a certain position in Air France or? something just it was not so much about uh, going up in uh, the company it was one job that I was dreaming of and it was uh, actually being the executive assistant of uh, the executive vice president for marketing and network at that time and he was a guy that I found very inspiring not in terms of uh, management and uh, let's say his talent with people but really in terms of vision in terms of intuition what the business should be tomorrow he was really amazing and I wanted to learn from him directly. And so I just said, okay, I want to be his uh, executive assistant. And uh, it became true uh, a few months uh, later. And I think that was maybe one of the real game changers in my career because in two years, I learned more than I would have learned in 10 or 15 years uh, in the company. Did your manager help you um, land that role with the, as the executive yes. assistant? I think he helped me first by allowing me to express what I wanted to do. Since that moment, I was able to go and uh, make myself also the steps that I needed to do to uh, apply for the position. What, what were some of the steps that you took at the time to make sure that you were a good fit for the position and could land the role? Um, well, I knew the, 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 the guy that uh, was uh, held the, the position uh, at that time. So I discussed with him and I shared with him that I wanted to have his position when, when he would do something else. And uh, he was also of good advice uh, in terms of what really the job is about. And I'm sure that he also... Uh, made sure that uh, the EVP uh, would know that uh, I was one of the candidates. And uh, to be honest, I think I was the only one that uh, really uh, made the step, the proactive step 
to say, I would like to do the job. So one day my phone uh, uh, rang and I was uh, called by his uh, assistant saying, uh, can you come and uh, see uh, that guy? Uh, so I thought it was for a business uh, motive. So I was a bit uh, yeah, shy and impressed. So I quickly went to his office and what did I do wrong? Maybe we made a mistake, I don't know. And in the end, it was just to have a chat for uh, the position. So I was not prepared at all. It was a, a disaster in terms of, in terms of uh, interview, but uh, in the end I got the position. So. Amazing. Um, so what were some of the ways that you that your motivation changed over time? So one of the things I you mentioned was that you you get bored quickly and you always love to learn. And I guess that's an amazing skill yeah. to carry in any role that you have in a company. Um, <laughs> over time, as your roles changed and you kind of grew into more executive roles in the company as well, um, what were your main motivators and how did those change in different positions? I think really the, 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 the change came from uh, the focus I was putting on content to the focus I then put on people. That's really the way, uh, I, I don't know how to describe it uh, differently. That's really what changed. The content in an airline is uh, just great because uh, our business has changed over time uh, either because the competition was changing, we were disrupted by the local carriers, the uh, outside world also make it different every day. You have a war somewhere, you have a disease. You see today with uh, the COVID, uh, the huge impact it has on airlines. I mean, our business is always changing. Mm -hmm. There's not one normal year. We just manage crisis uh, after crisis. <laughs> and so the, the content is super rich. And I think that explains why I never got bored at that time. Mm -hmm. But um, when I grew up a bit, and I cannot explain how, why, and when, but uh, there's one day when I realized that uh, most of my motivation going to work was to meet with the team and to try and see how I could help them and how I could change the way they work much more than what they were doing. So I remember when it happened, and I think I was uh, 10 years in Air France when it happened, but I cannot, yeah. I think it was really something very progressive and uh, coming with maturity, whatever. Uh, I had the managerial positions very early in Air France. I was, uh, I think, 24 or 25 when I had my first managerial role and I was a disaster. But over time, I think I started to understand what people needed, what I wanted to do with them and how we could uh, really grow together by uh, building a joint vision by creating teams. When I say creating diverse teams, it seems obvious, but uh, it was not for me at that time and seeing how you can use everybody's personality, their strengths, their differences also to make a very uh, balanced team and uh, everyone has to, to bring something uh, to a team and how you could take benefit of uh, these differences was something uh, very, very, uh, yeah. Uh, a breakthrough for me, even if it seems uh, obvious uh, for maybe most uh, most of you, and um, and since then I think uh, yeah, ninety percent of my motivation came from taking the teams always one step uh, above and uh, putting more challenges, but also helping them to overcome uh, the difficulties and always make uh, great things. And I love when my teams tell me. Yeah, you ask, you are so demanding, but you always do it with a smile. I am still a child and that's what makes me smile and have when, fun. When you started off as a manager, um, when you were 24, 25, and obviously you had limited experience and you were learning just on the job, um, as you grew and had more experience, did you also receive more support in becoming a better manager, actually? Or is this something that you just learned on the job? Did you kind of, how did you uh, develop that skill? I had a few uh, opportunities to go to trainings, but maybe maybe I was too young and uh, I didn't have enough experience at that time. To be honest, that's not where I learned. Mm -hmm. I, I really learned on the spot uh, with my mistakes uh, and also with uh, experience. I think, uh, again, uh, at 24, 25, there was stuff that I was not able to understand and that became obvious when I was 30 or 35. So. It's also a lesson of, uh, yeah, I am not patient, as I told you, but I think some stuff come with, uh, 
experience maturity age or maybe some are more gifted than others and uh, it's more natural maybe for some people to to understand that much more early uh, in their career but for me it came uh, yeah around uh, 35 I would say and uh, and it really changed my uh, my career and my motivation and I think uh, yeah my relationship with uh, with the people mm -hmm. Um, Delphine and I have spoken before about how there is this kind of famous glass ceiling at some point in your career, um, especially when you stay in a company for a long time. So um, I think something around 80% of salary raises come from switching jobs. And it's very rare to be able to uh, continue to grow so much in the same company in such a long time span. Um, what do you think about the importance of internal networking and how did internal networking or building your reputation in the company contribute to your growth over time? Um, I'm not sure I have the right answer. I was not so much into networking. It's not easy for me to go to people and to build relationship uh, if I don't have a reason for it. So I think Internal networking is for sure very efficient, but that's not the way I, I built my career. I think I, I needed to prove my uh, efficiency on the you know, work-based. The way I developed, I think, was uh, really based on content and based on my achievements. I don't really care about hierarchy, about uh, the different positions in a company. So I could be very rude to an EVP uh, if uh, I didn't see why he was in this position and if I could not understand his uh, added value or when he would uh, provide the wrong uh, statements, I would always dare to speak up. It did not only help me, sometimes it was a, a little bit difficult, but I think that's the way I built my reputation in the company. Someone very independent, mm -hmm. uh, content-based, maybe with uh, not enough uh, relationship skills, but uh, at least with a uh, some uh, relevance in terms of, uh, of content. So again, I'm not, I'm, I'm not asking uh, everyone to follow my example. I, I'm not sure it's the right one. I think uh, internal networking, it's a plus for sure, uh, but you also have to do with who you are and uh, that's not who I was, so I could not do that. The advice is I would like to share is really, yeah, be authentic, be who you are. And uh, it took me a lot of time to uh, uh, come to the workplace with myself, with the real myself and not hiding some of my uh, personality. And I think that also made a difference. So network if you like that and don't network if you don't like that. <laughs> so I'll ask a follow up question to that. So I think the other situation that could occur, let's take an example of someone who doesn't like internal networking. It doesn't fit in with their personality. They're very talented in their job, but they're not able to really sell themselves well in the company. So they work very hard, but they don't um, share that with the necessary people. So how did you balance that exactly? Is that something that you did naturally or you just were lucky to have managers that always recognized your work? Maybe it's a bit of both, but when you hate to sell yourself, which was exactly uh, how I would describe me, uh, usually you love to sell your ideas and sell uh, your work team. Mm. So don't sell yourself, but go and sell your ideas and uh, put your guts uh, in order to make sure that they will be heard and uh, they will be uh, listened to. If you don't like to speak up, to be assertive about your work, maybe you like to speak up and to be assertive about your teams. There's always something that uh, you will feel authentically able to, uh, to sell and sell that. That's very good advice. Um, <laughs> looking at uh, more external aspects, um, did you, also have to deal in your career with um, external hires that came in in more senior positions um, and how did you balance that working with more senior people that were coming in but also um, your internal progression um, as someone who was very content focused and eventually also became a manager? Actually Air France is a, is a, is a company, uh, it's a very specific company. Uh, the turnover is very low I think it's like one person a year. It's nothing. Yes. Wow, that is. Very and I mean, the salaries are very low. It's not people don't come uh, for money. They just start and they 
fall in love with the company, with the business, with the people, and they don't leave. So actually, first of all, we didn't have so much of uh, newcomers. It was, uh, um, yeah, it was not that often. And again, talking about myself, I always loved these moments when we would have new people because I love to be inside and outside, and I'm very curious, as I told you. So to me, actually, these moments were opportunities to meet new people and to understand different ways of working and uh, new ideas. Uh, it was often uh, people coming to lead the company because uh, as the turnover was low, most of the newcomers actually were the CEO or really the, the top uh, managers of the company. And I always felt a bit of yeah, curiosity to, uh, to understand uh, how they, they would uh, try and, uh, and uh, yeah change the, the company. So I see it positively. And again, as, as I previously told you, I think uh, if you're authentic, if you have strong beliefs, uh, just try and uh, fight for them. And uh, yeah, whether it's with internal people or with new newcomers, it doesn't make a big difference. What was the reason that you decided to stay in Air France so long? So I'm assuming that you also were headhunted over the years by many, many recruiters. Um, what really made you stay? I mean, you said the churn was 1%. That's very low. Um, what, what was the main thing that drew you and, and why did you not decide to pursue other roles, uh, maybe more senior roles in other companies? What, what made you stay in Air France for so long? I, I think I was very lucky to get new challenges and uh, I had a very quick improvement or quick uh, development in terms of career in Air France. I'm not sure I could have reached that elsewhere. I had opportunities. Or I, I, I was hand-hunted for positions uh, that never seemed to be as interesting as the ones uh, that I had. Or um, And each time I started to get bored, either, and that was most of the time, I would have a new proposal, or I came to my manager saying, I'm starting to get bored, so please do something or I will, uh, I will leave. I never considered, as I told you, I never thought I would stay that long, but I never either um, wanted to leave Air France just because I could make a big step in terms of salary. I had everything I wanted. I had a dream content, dream teams. Uh, I had a freedom that was uh, amazing. I could really... Uh, uh, yeah, think uh, independently and then have a, an impact on the strategy of the company for a long time. That was far enough for me. Mm. That's really nice to hear. And <laughs> going back to your first day at Air France, um, what advice would you give yourself? This is a very difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should have tried and better understand the way it worked, the codes. The, you know, the implicit rules, uh, the, the company culture. I was very different. And so, as I told you, I was a bit uh, the, the rebel. I was a bit uh, yeah, fighting the authority or the rules. On the one hand, I don't want to give up on that. I think it can be very useful. And again, you have to be aligned with what you, you believe is right. So, but maybe I was a little bit too pushy and I should have understood that uh, Maybe I could have done uh, things differently and maybe um, I, I could have learned before all the emotional or the yeah, implicit uh, way of working of a company, the relationship between the, the people. I think I was a little bit, well, I was totally blind to that for a long time. Although it doesn't seem that that was a problem for you because you still, you know, you had a very good relationship with your team and progressed really impressively um, over your career. So um, maybe... Yeah, but I had a lot of fights with either my, not so much my peers, but with the, with the level uh, above and maybe it could have been smoother, but I don't regret anything. <laughs> Recently left Air France. Um, so when you decided to leave, did you have a very strong idea of what you want to, like what, what kind of role you're looking for next? Or did you just reach a point where you wanted to take some time off? I started to, to see my limits and uh, what... I could not renew myself forever and I had less ideas and, uh, and that's something that I cannot really uh, bear. So uh, I didn't want to, to become uh, useless or less efficient, less effective for the company. So I think that's one. I also, uh, maybe when uh, I reached uh, 40, I think, I don't know if it's the midlife crisis or whatever, but uh, I wanted to be more committed to uh, either education, health, uh, helping others, 
societal develop impact. Your, exactly yeah. societal impact you're fully right um which i could not do uh while working for air france because yeah if i work i work 100 percent at least so i could not manage uh, to de develop this on top of uh, my job uh, within air france but at the same time i was totally unable to forecast the next step and uh, most people told me don't leave as long as you don't know what you're going to do first find a new job and then you leave the company and that was uh, the advice i got for the last two years <laughs> but it didn't make sense for me and uh, i have a coach that i met a few years ago that i see from time to time and she's the last one I ask advice to, and uh, I think I made it on purpose. <laughs> but uh, she's the only one that told me, leave, mm. take time for yourself, take time for this uh, commitments you want to have in terms of societal impact, etc. And you need time for Air France to take less and less space in your brain. And one day you will know what you want to do. And uh, that was, the, uh, I think, the, the best advice for me. But... Uh, there again, you have to manage with everybody judgment. And uh, people told me, wow, you're brave. I don't think I'm brave, but uh, it, it doesn't fit with what uh, people usually do. But there again, I think it was uh, the best decision for me. And so uh, indeed I left uh, in uh, November. The year 2020 was crazy for an airline <laughs> and I was in charge of not only transformation and the strategic plan, but also the day-to-day -day network. Where would we fly tomorrow? Uh, and with COVID, it was uh, yeah just an endless job. We worked night and days, uh, weekends uh, for yeah since uh, last February. So I was also very, I think, exhausted. In uh, August uh, last year, I took a few weeks uh, break with my kids and. Uh, I realized it could not go uh, like that forever. And it was really the perfect moment for me to leave because uh, on top of what I wanted to bring to society, I also have two children. My daughter is gonna be 10 uh, in uh, next month. And uh, my son has just uh, been at seven and uh, I didn't see them grow. And uh, I, don't sp I didn't spend so much time with them. And I also wanted to have a little bit more time with them. Yeah. with for me as well and so uh, i think for me it was a perfect moment to leave so sorry for the very long answer but i have no clue what i want to do it's actually a perfect answer you're very honest about that and i think um i, I really agree with what you're saying that sometimes it's best to step away so that you have time to process things because if you're in a job you don't have this capacity to really think through these things so very excited to see what you what you do next as well, Amel. But uh, it's also about um, what do you want in life? And uh, I spent 20 years working like hell. Yeah. Uh, and I loved it. Again, I'm not complaining at all, but it's just I, I worked from morning to evening and that was my whole life. And um, I realized when I stopped that there was so much more and I am reading so much at the moment. I love reading, but yeah, I stopped okay. reading for uh, a long time. I just take photographs of the sky and uh, whatever. I just enjoy life. I just find everything beautiful. I, I have time for that. I have uh, every morning I do sports and uh, I am in much better shape also physically. And uh, that's also something very important. I think women with the pressure of, uh, you know, having the same uh, uh, success as men, sometimes we just forget about what we need. And um this morning I realized that I've quit for five months now and I've, I've never got bored. I just enjoy it so much. My mm. main worry is, uh, will I want to work again one day? And, uh, we, well, I have to, uh, <laughs> but uh, not now. <laughs> yeah, so I think it's really interesting that you say that because, you know, given that you were in such a senior position and you worked for so long in the company, you were working so much, I would think that you would have some kind of withdrawal symptoms, but it's amazing to hear that you're just enjoying it because I think instead of focusing of what you're going to do next, just to enjoy the time with your family, take photos of the sky, read books. Um, I think that's, that's amazing. I mean, you earned it, right? You worked really hard for so long. Yes. So. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you for listening to our video series. We hope this story will inspire you to take action and reveal your unique potential. Make sure to follow Rising Pineapples on our social media. If you enjoy the talk, we'd love for you to share it with another woman who it might inspire.